The Chimist by Thomas Ligotti Hello, miss. Why, yes, as a matter of fact, I am looking for some company this evening. My name is Simon, and you are... Rosemary. Funny, I was just daydreaming in the key of rosy crucianism. Never mind. Please sit and watch out for splinters on your chair so you don't catch your dress. It appears that everything around here has come to the point of frays and splinters, but what this old place lacks in refinement of decor is amply offset by its atmosphere, don't you think? Yes, as you say, I suppose it does serve its purpose. It's a little lax as far as table service, though. I'm afraid that in the way of drinks one must procure for oneself. Thank you. I'm glad you think I have a nice way of talking. Now, can I get you something from the bar? All right, a beer you shall have. And do me a favor, please. Before I return, you will already have taken that wad of gum out of your mouth. Thank you, and I'll be back shortly with our drinks. Here you are, Rosie, one beer from the bar. Just don't belch and we'll get along fine. I'm pleased to see you've gotten rid of your gum, though I hope you didn't swallow it. One's gut should probably remain ignorant of what it's like to accommodate bubblegum and beer in the same digestive episode. I know it's your gut, but I take an interest in what gets into the workings of any human vessel. That's right, vessel. You want me to spell it? No, I'm not making fun of you. It's just that there are certain interactions that take place when the vessel in question is the delicate system of H. sapiens, as opposed to a chalice in a church or a serum vial in a laboratory. Quite so, that none-too-sterile glass in your immaculate hand is a vessel. Now you've got it. My glass? Yes, you do see a lot of red in there. I like red drinks. Created this one myself. A red rum ginny, I call it. White rum, gin, pale ginger ale, and ideally cranberry juice, though the bartender here had to substitute some maraschino solution, which has neither the rich red color nor a fraction of the tartness of your smile. Here, take a sip. If you don't like it, say so. Yes, different is the word for it, the wellspring of its interest. Even the most faithful adherence to an established mixological formula results in some difference that can be discerned in even the most banal of cocktails, not to mention other concoctions in the alcoholic formulary. You just have to cultivate the sensitivity to notice that difference. Ask any wine taster. And that sensitivity may be extended to every experience in our lives. Though we may think we're doing the same old thing in the same old way, day in and day out, fluctuations from the norm are the norm. You can't step into the same river twice, as the philosopher said. Each passing moment diverts to follow its own course from the one before, often quite strangely. I have a very keen appreciation of diversity, if I do say so myself. You're smiling at my emphasis. You think you know something about me, and perhaps you do. Sharp girl. But perversity, as you no doubt were thinking, is only one of the more ostentatious forms of the diverse, and diversions call the tune of the dance of life, even at the subatomic level. Wow, you really guzzle down that bubbly beverage. Would you like another, or perhaps I can offer you something of my own invention? Yes, I have created other drinks. There's another red potation I've pioneered that's actually just a variation on a standard number. The sweet and sour Bloody Mary, made with high-test vodka, tonic water, sugar, a lemon slice, and ketchup. It does sound like a meal in itself at that. Very fortifying. No, sorry to spoil your joke. My fondness for crimson highballs does not extend to the vampire's neck-drawn nectar. Besides, I'm quite able to work during daylight hours. Where? Well, I suppose I can tell you, Sub Rosa, that I'm employed by a pharmaceutical company not far from here. I'm a chemist there. Yes, really. 
Well, it's nice the way you could see right off that I wasn't no average guy just looking for some fun after a hard day's work. Perceptive girl. However, I did in fact come directly here after working a little overtime. I noticed while I was at the bar counter that you were eyeing and towing the briefcase I brought in with me and set so discreetly under the table. You guessed it, I do happen to be carrying work stuff in there, among other things. Spot on, my dear. It would be foolish to leave anything important out in the car in this red light district. Well, I wouldn't say that this part of town is simply a pit. It is, of course, that. But your colloquialism doesn't begin to describe the various dimensions of decrepitude in the local geography. Decrepitude, bro. It has your pit in it, and a lot more besides. I speak from experience, more than you would believe. This whole city is most certainly a pitiful corpse, while the neighborhood outside the walls of this bar has the distinction of being the withering heart of the deceased. And I am a devoted student of its anatomy, a pathologist after a fashion, with an eye for necroses that others overlook. For instance, have you ever been to that place called Speakeasy? Well, then you have some acquaintance with a bastardized nostalgia, the putrescence of things past. Yes, up a flight of stairs inside an old burlesque house is a high, echoey hall with a leftover deco interior of arching mirrors and chrome chandeliers, and there the giant painted silhouettes of bony flappers and gaunt Gatsby's sport about the curving ballroom walls, towering over the dance floor, their funereal elegance mocking the awkward gyrations of the living. An old dream with a new veneer. It's fascinating, you know, how an obsolete madness is sometimes adopted and stylized in an attempt to ghoulishly preserve it. These are the days of second-hand fantasies and out-of-date distractions. But there are other sights in this city that I think are much more interesting not the least of which are those storefront temples of dubious denomination. There's one on 3rd and Dickerson called the Church of the True Dividing Light, not to be mistaken, I presume, with that false light which blinds so many searching eyes. Oddly enough, I've yet to see any light at all shining through the windows of this gray dwarfish building, and I always look for some sort of illumination as I ride by. I tell you, no one worships this city as I do, especially its witticisms of proximity, one strange thing next to another, which together add up to a greater strangeness. One of the more grotesque examples of this phenomenon occurs when you observe that a little shop whose display window features a fabulous array of prosthetic devices is right next door to Marv's second-hand city. Then there are those places you've noticed them, I'm sure, that are freakishly suggestive in a variety of ways. One of them is that pink and black checkerboard box on Bender Boulevard that calls itself Bill's Bender Lounge, where a garish marquee advertises nightly entertainment. And if you stare at that legend long enough, the word nightly will begin to connote more than the interval between dusk and dawn. Soon this simple term becomes truly evocative, as if it were code for the most exotic of nocturnal entertainments. And speaking of entertainment, I should cite that establishment whose owner, no doubt an epicure of musical comedy, gave it the title of Guys and Dolls Incorporated. What a genius of vulgarity, considering that this business is devoted solely to the sale and repair of mannequins, or is it really a front for a bordello of dummies? No offense intended, Rosalie. I could go on. I still haven't mentioned Miss Wanda's wigs, or that ancient and squalid hotel that boasts a bath in every room, but maybe you're becoming a bit bored. Yes, I can understand what you mean when you say you don't notice that stuff after a while. The mind becomes dull and complacent, I know. Sometimes I get that way myself. But it seems that just when I'm comfortably mired in complacency, some good jolt comes along. Maybe I'm sitting in my car, waiting for a red light to change. A derelict, 
drunk or brain diseased, comes up to my defenseless vehicle and pounds on my windows, with both fists, like so, and demands a cigarette. He touches his ragged lips with scissored fingers to convey his meaning, having left speech behind him long ago. A cigarette? I am a chemist, good sir, not a tobacconist. The traffic signal changes and I drive on, watching the bum's half-collapsed form shrinking in my rearview mirror. But somehow I've taken him on as a passenger, a ghostly shape sitting bleary-eyed beside me and raving about all kinds of senseless and fascinating things, the autobiography of confusion. And in a little while I'm back on the lookout once more. Touching story, don't you? Yes, I suppose it is getting a bit late, and we haven't made much progress. Your apartment? I think that would be fine. No, I had nothing else in mind as far as where we might do business. Your place is okay. Where is it, though? No kidding. That's the old temple towers with a new cognomen. Excellent. Our ride will take us through the neighborhood in the shadow of the brewery. What floor of the building do you live on? Well, a veritable penthouse, an urban airy. The loftier the better, I say. Shall we go, then? My car is parked right out front. I hope it hasn't decided to rain. Nope, it's a beautiful night. But look, that's my car where that cop is standing. Just stay calm. I certainly won't say anything if you don't. You're not by chance a vice officer in disguise, are you, Rosicrantz? You wouldn't betray this unsuspecting Hamlet. A simple no would have been sufficient. If you use that kind of language again, I'll turn you into the authorities right now, and then we can see what sort of arrest record you've accumulated in your brilliant career. Silence. That's good. Just let me do the talking. Here goes. Hi, officer. Yes, that's my car. It's parked okay, isn't it? Geez, that's a relief. For a second, I thought. My license and registration? Sure thing. Here you go. Beg pardon? Yeah, I guess I am a little far from home. But I work close by. I'm a stockbroker. Here's my card. You know, I've been in the business for some time now, and I can almost tell just by the look of a guy if he's got something invested in the market. I'd bet that you have. See there? I knew I was right. Doesn't matter if you're just small time. Hey, have you been in touch with an investment counselor lately? Well, you should. There's a lot going on. People talk about inflation, recession, depression. Forget it. If you know where to put your finances, I mean really know, it doesn't matter if it's Friday the 13th and the streets are bloody with corporate corpses. Smart advice is what you need. It's all anyone needs. For example, and I tell you this just to make a point, there's an outfit in this city, not a half mile from here in fact, by the name of Lockmeyer Laboratories. They've been working on a new product and are just about ready to market it. Of course, I don't understand the whole technical end of it, but I know for sure that it's going to revolutionize the field of, what do you call it, psychopharmaceuticals. Revolutionize it the way antidepressants did. It'll be bigger than antidepressants. You know what I mean? That's the kind of thing you've got to know. That's right, officer. Lockmeyer Laboratories. Good company all around. I own stock in it myself. What tip? Hell. Hey, you don't have to thank me. Beg pardon? A tip for me? Well, now that you mention it, there probably are better neighborhoods for a man such as myself to be frequenting. You've got my promise that you won't be seeing me around here anymore. I appreciate that, officer. I'll remember. And you remember Lock Lab. Right then. Night to you. Wait for his car to turn the corner, Rosie, before getting in mine. We'll let the lawman maintain the illusion that his warning has set me straight with regard to the dangers of this seamy area and your seamy self. He looked at you like an old friend. Could have been trouble for both of us. You're a smart girl to have sat at my table tonight. I think my briefcase impressed him, don't you? Okay, we can get in the car now. 
Yes, I did get us out of a touchy situation with that cop. But I hope when you just mentioned my BS apropos of that scene with the policeman, you had in mind the Bachelor of Science degree I received when I was 12 years old. This is your last warning about unclean idioms. Now roll down your window and let's air your words out of this car as we drive. And as far as my deceiving that fine officer goes, I actually didn't. No, I'm not really a stockbroker. I told you the truth about being in chemicals, and I told that mole-eyed patrolman the truth when I advised him to put his money in Lockmeyer Lab, for we are about to market a new mind medicine that should make our investors as pleased as amphetamine addicts in an all-night coffee shop. How did I know he owned stock in the first place? That is strange, isn't it? I guess I was just lucky. This is just my lucky night, and yours too. You don't much like the polizia, do you, Rosa? Yes, of course I can blame you. Without them, where would all of us outlaws be? What would we have? Only a lawless paradise, and paradise is a bore. Violence without violation is only a noise heard by no one, the most horrendous sound in the universe. No, I realize you don't have anything to do with violence. I didn't mean to imply you did. Yes, I can drop you off back at the bar when we finished at your apartment. Of course. Right now, let's just enjoy the ride. What do you mean, so what's to enjoy? Can't you see we're nearing the brewery? Look, there's its beer golden sign, advertising the alchemical quest to transmute base ingredients into liquid gold. Alchemical, Rosetta. And I'm not referring to that cheap jack firm of Allied Chem. Just look around at these caved-in houses, these seedy stores, each one of them a sacred site of the city, a shrine, if you will. You won't? You've seen it all a million times? A slum is a slum is a slum, eh? Always the same. Always? Never. What about when it's raining, and the brown bricks of these old places start to drip and darken, and the smoke-gray sky is the smoky mirror of your soul? You give a lightning blink at a row of condemned buildings, starkly outlining them, and do they blink back at you? Or does that happen only in another type of storm, when windows are slyly browed with city-soiled clumps of snow? Was it under such conditions that you first thought of all the cold and dark places in the universe, all the clammy basements and gloomy attics of creation? Bleak locales you'd rather not think about, but at the time couldn't keep from your mind. Another time you could have. No two times are the same. No two lives are alike. We're like aliens to one another. And when you're traveling through these streets with some stranger, you have to contend with how they see things, the way you now must deal with my 2020 visions and I with your blasé nearsightedness. Are these the same gutted houses you saw last night, or even a second ago? Or are they like the fluxing clouds that swirl above the chimneys and trees, and then pass on. The alchemical transmutations are infinite and continuous, working all the time like slaves in the great laboratory. Tell me you can't perceive their work, especially in this part of the city, especially where the glamour and sanity of former days wears a new mask of rats and rot, where an old style is transformed by time into a parody of itself which no man could foresee where greater and greater schisms are forever developing between past shapes and future shapelessness, and finally where the evolution toward ultimate diversity can be glimpsed as if in a magic mirror. This is, of course, the real alchemy, as you've probably gathered, and not that other kind which theorized that everything was struggling toward an auric perfection, lead into gold, lower matter into higher spirit, no, it's not like that. Just the opposite in point of fact. Please don't put that hunk of gum in your mouth. Throw it out the window, now. As I was saying, everything is just variation without a theme. 
Oh, perhaps there is some unchanging ideal, some sturdy absolute. Scientifically, I suppose, we should allow for that improbability. But to reach that ideal would mean a hopeless stroll along the path to hypothetically higher worlds. And on the way our ideas become feverish and confused. What begins as a solitary truth soon proliferates like malignant cells in the body of a dream, a body whose true outline remains unknown. Perhaps then we should be grateful to the whims of chemistry, the caprices of circumstance, and the enigmas of personal taste for giving us such an array of strictly local realities and desires. No, I didn't always think this freaky, as you put it. But I can tell you almost precisely when I began to see the truth of things. I was a callow freshman in college, even callower than most, given my precocious progress. One day something seemed to change in my chemistry, as I like to think of it. It was quite horrible for a while. Eventually, though, I realized that the alteration was from a false chemistry to a true one. Yes, that's when I decided to pursue the subject as my career, my calling. But that's a story in itself, and here we are now at your apartment tower. Please don't slam the car door the way you were about to. No need to draw attention to our presence. You're right, there's really no one around to be attentive anyway. The local street firmen seem to have withdrawn into their burrows. Oops, almost forgot my briefcase. Wouldn't want to leave it unattended in this neighborhood, isn't that right? You're smiling about my briefcase, aren't you, Mary Rose? You think you know something again. Well, go ahead and think that if you like. Everybody likes to think he has inside information. That policeman, for example. You could see how pleased he was to instantly become a man of knowledge, even if it's only by way of inside information about some stock on the market. Everybody wants to know what's what. Scientia Arcana. The real dope. Maybe I do have some dope in my case. Then again, maybe it's just an empty prop. A leather vessel with a void inside. But you already know that I work for a dope company. You were thinking that, weren't you? Well, let's go up to your place and find out. Cozy little lobby you have here. But I'm afraid the atmosphere is doing strange things to that pot of ferns over there. Of course I know they're artificial. Which only means that nature, one of the great chemists, made them at one remove, that's all. Here, this elevator seems to be working, though a little noisily. After you, Lady R. The twenty-second floor, if I remember right, and I always do. Uh, I believe there's to be no smoking in this elevator, if you don't mind. Thank you. And here we are. I'll bet your place is down this way. See, I am always right. Isn't that funny? Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. Well, your apartment has a very nice door. No, you're wrong. There's no such thing as just like all the others. Yours is quite different, can't you see that? And tonight your door is visibly different from any other time you've seen it. I'm not just being egotistical about my unique presence at your threshold this evening. Do you see what I mean? Well, I'm sorry if you feel I've been lecturing you all night. I was a pedagogue once, which I suppose is obvious. It's just that there are some important things I must impart to you, my little rosebud, before we're through. Okay? Now, let's go in and see what kind of view you have from up here. Keep the ceiling lights off, please, so that I don't have to look at a double of this sleazy room reflected in your window. One of your dim lamps should give us all the light we need. There, that's fine. You do have a good view of the city from this height. I think it's perfect, not too far up. I live in a mere two-story house myself, and being up here makes me dizzily realize what I'm missing. From this lofty keep I could look nightly out upon the city and its constant mutations. A different city every night. Yes, Rosie, I have to say you're right. Sarcastic tone and all. The city is indeed also a vessel, 
and it's one that obediently takes the shape of very strange contents. The great chemists are working out unfathomable formulae down there. Look at those lights outlining the different venues and avenues below. Look at their lines and interconnections. They're like a skeleton of something, the skeleton of a dream, the hidden framework ready at any moment to shift its structure to support a new shape. The great chemists are always dreaming new things and risking that they may wake up while doing so. Should that ever happen, you can be assured there will be hell to pay. My imagination? No, I don't think it's vivid at all. On the contrary, it's not nearly potent enough. My poor imaginative faculties have always needed extensions. That's why I'm here with you. You're smiling again, or rather you're smirking. Funny word, smirk. Rather like an extraterrestrial surname. Simon Smirk. How do you think that sounds? Yes, maybe we are wasting too much time. But of course we'll have to endure just one more delay while I rummage around in my briefcase and remove what you've been waiting for. So you hope it's good dope, eh? Well, you'll have a chance to find out, since you seem so anxious to become a vessel yourself for my chemicals. No, stay seated just where you are, please. There's no reason for you to glimpse every elixir I've got in here. The only thing I have that might interest you is secured in one squat little container screwed tightly closed with a black cap. And here it is. Yes, it does look like a bottle of powdered light. That's very observant. What is it? I thought you would know by now. Here, hold out your hand and you can have a closer look. Just a little mound sprinkled in the middle of your sweaty palm about one brainful, to be precise. Doesn't it look like pulverized diamonds? It glitters. Yes, it does. I don't blame you for thinking it might be dangerous to snort, or whatever else you imagine you're supposed to do with it. But if you watch my magic dust very closely, you'll see that you don't have to do anything at all. See? It dissolved right into you. Disappeared completely, except for a few stray grains. But don't worry about them. Calm down, the burning will soon go away. There's no point in trying to rub the drug off your hand. It's in your system now. And it certainly won't help to get excited, nor are threats of any use to you. Please remain seated in that chair. Can you feel any effects yet? I mean, besides the fact that you're no longer able to move your arms or legs. That's just the beginning of this nightly entertainment. The opalescent substance you've just absorbed has now made possible a very interesting relationship between us, my red, red rose. The drug has rendered you fantastically sensitive to the shaping influence of a certain form of energy, namely that which is being generated by me, or rather through me. To put it romantically, I'm now dreaming you. That's really the only way I can explain it that you might understand. Not dreaming about you, like some old love song. I'm dreaming you. Your arms and legs don't respond to your brain's commands because I'm dreaming of someone who is as still as a statue. I hope you can appreciate how remarkable this is. Damn! I suppose that was your attempt to scream. You really are terrified, aren't you? Just to be safe, perhaps I'd better dream of someone who hasn't anything to scream with. There, that should do it. You do look strange, though, like that. But this is only just the beginning. These minor tricks are child's play and I'm sure don't impress you in any way whatever. Soon I'll show you that I can really make an impression once I put my mind to it. Is there something in your eyes? Yes, I can see there is. A question. Right now you would like to ask, if only you still had the means to do so, what's to become of old Rosie? It's only fair that you should know. We are presently coming into perfect tune with each other, my dreams and my dream girl. 
you were about to become the flesh-and-blood kaleidoscope of my imagination. In the latter stages of this procedure anything might happen. Your form will know no limits of diversity as the great chemists themselves take over. Soon I will put my dreaming in the hands of a prodigious insurrection of entity, and I'm sure there will be some surprises for both of us. That's one thing which never changes. Nevertheless, there is still a problem with this process. It's not really perfect, certainly not marketable, as we say in the pill business. And wouldn't that be boring if it were perfect? What I mean to say is that, under the stress of such diverse metamorphoses, the original structure of the object somehow breaks down. The consequence of this is simple. You can never be as you once were. I'm very sorry. You'll have to remain in whatever curious incarnation you take on at the dream's end, which should rattle the wits of whoever is unfortunate enough to find you. But don't worry, you will not live long after I leave here, and by then you will have experienced godlike powers of proteation which I myself cannot hope to know, no matter how intimately I may try. And now I think we can proceed with what has been your destiny all along. Are you ready? I am entirely ready and by degrees am giving myself over to those forces which go their own way and take us with them. Can you feel us both being swept into a tempest of transfigurations? Can you feel the fevers of this chemist? The power of my dreaming. My dreaming. My dreaming. My... Now, Rose of Madness, Bloom!